Welcome to the uh, first meeting of the South Central Pennsylvania Meteorological Society in our new program year. My name is Jonathan Spare, I'm the president. I invite all of you are here this afternoon, particularly because we have one of our most entertaining speakers. And I told my wife, I said, I know that it's going to be an interesting afternoon when he's like, should have stopped for us. And Richard will tell you more about it. Do we have anybody here who's here for the very first time, never been here before? Okay, we'd like you to tell us your name, where you're from, and what you're researching. Okay? I'm not a researcher, okay. I'm just an interested part. Okay. <laughs> my name's Linda Pearson. And where are you from? I'm from the Dover area. Okay. Sir? Jeff Lander, I'm from Ohio. All right, and what are you researching? The saxophone. The saxophone. <laughs> and I saw another hand in the back there. It's Amy and Brad were both from Spring Grove, okay. and we're here for the entertainment. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. At this time, we will have uh, the reading of our minutes by our secretary, Richard uh, Robinstein. <laughs> Near Jonathan uh, opened the uh, July, June's 11 program at the History Center. Uh, there were two new attendees at that time. Um, the minutes were read by myself and approved by board, and they will be filed uh, as required. The April and May treasury reports were given by Margaret Burr. The cash balance on April 30th, 2023, was 15000 $278.55. And on May 31st, 2023, the cash balance of $14,975.25. Membership at that time stood at 140. Uh, during that time, we were also in the process of sending out renewal for the organization. Um, at that time, it was 42 that took one year renewals. Two that we were returning members, and 38 were two members, um, new members since 2022 or seven. Um, they co highlighted her upcoming events for the, for the coming month and advised that the, this was being recorded on YouTube uh, as well as Zoom and Facebook. Jonathan um, also discussed at that time. Was a vote was needed for the officers. Those were Treasurer Margaret Bird, Reporting Secretary Richard Robinstein, Corresponding Secretary Rebecca Einstein, and Director at Large was Jason Miller. Motion requested to accept the ballot June Lloyd first and seconded by Jonathan. All members in attendance were approved. Um, thanking Mindy for her service as she which continues to help as, as needed. Um, Jonathan also thank those that have helped with the South Central York County Senior Center in Freedom. Uh, it was very well received and benefited all those in attendance. Um, also that uh, Vice President Richard Kunkel stated the program and is coming up with a new program for the fiscal year 2024. Thank you. Treasurer's and membership report, Barbara. Mm -hmm. Okay, it'll be two reports for June and July. The um, Balance uh, at uh, on May 31st, 2023, 14,975 dollars and 27 cents. Receipts for June were membership renewals of $1,345, publication sale $14, donation of $10, PayPal memberships $97 and one cent, 
uh, and a uh, for the classes that we did down in Southern New York County, uh, $135. And that total for receipts, $1,601.01. Disbursements for June, Becky Ann Stein, miscellaneous publication mailings of $19.93. To Margaret Berg for uh, copier supplies and mis miscellaneous published publication mailings for the fiscal, this was for the full fiscal year of 2022 to 23, uh, $104.92 and Pennsylvania sales tax for July of 2022 through December of 2022, uh, $4.74. Total disbursement, $129.59, leaving the cash balance at uh, uh, as of June 30th, $16,446.69. Uh, that's also the uh, balance at July 1st. And receipts for July, membership renewals of $235. That's the total receipts. Disbursements, Pennsylvania sales tax for January 2023 through June 2023, $30.47. That's the total for the disbursements and the cash balance as of July 31st, $16,651.22. Membership, uh, 104 members, new for the year, five members, not renewed yet, 35 members. And um, one thing for those of you who receive your newsletter by mail, um, you will see uh, above your name a number that's your your member number, and I'm also adding the expiration date. Since we started the two year um, membership availability, um, it, it's kind of confusing for everybody, including me. So, um, we, your expiration date will be on the um, mail, the post the mail newsletters. I'm working on something for the uh, newsletters that go by email. And I haven't worked that out yet, but uh, we'll get that solved too, so that the people who get it by email will know when their expiration date is. Okay, that's it. Nicole? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming today. Uh, just a couple announcements about upcoming programs. Uh, tomorrow night, we have our bookmarked book, book club. If you've read Nine Months in Yorktown by Jim McClure, um, he will be speaking about that book um, tomorrow night online. On September 7th, we have our Writers' Roundtable. The speaker is Samantha Dorn, and she'll be presenting uh, a, a talk called Paved Over, Paved Over Comments. On September 9th is our second Saturday program. The speaker is Carl Stanball, speaking about Hanover's Forest Park. On September 14th, um, we have our annual membership meeting here in this room, as well as our community awards ceremony. And finally, on September 20th is our Civil War Roundtable. The speaker, speaker is Matthew Borders, speaking on the gamble of 1862, the Maryland campaign. So for more information and to register, please visit our website, yorkhistorycenter.org. Thank you. Thank you. Just a few announcements before I have Richard come introduce our speaker. If you haven't noticed that in the uh, main room is in a small exhibit on uh, General Jacob Devers, you might want to take a look at that. And also some other World War II memorabilia. I was looking at the other day with somebody is remarking how thin those people must have been to fit in those uniforms. So they were much thinner than I am. Also, I have an update from the state archives. They're over 50% moved now. So it looks like they're on track to probably reopen late October or early November, which is good news for us. So this time I'm going to have our Vice President Richard Clark will come and talk about future programs and introduce the speaker. We have some future programs to talk about, namely next month, which is uh, 
well, not next month, it's actually October, but it's October the 1st. Um, we have Scott Mingus, who's going to talk about striking for Pennsylvania, basically, to outline events of 160 years ago um, from the uh, Pennsylvania campaign of the Confederates when they invaded Pennsylvania. That includes pretty much all of South Central Pennsylvania. They didn't get across the river. That was their goal. They, were, they wanted to go to Philadelphia to make a mess, but they didn't. And of course, that culminated in the Battle of Gettysburg. He's always a very entertaining speaker, so we look forward to his presentation. Then on November, I think it's November the 5th, I am the speaker. And the title is the 1829 Answer in Defense of Katharina Ziegler of Cadoras Township to Accusations of Witchcraft. So the item that I came across in the newspaper, a lengthy article. She was accused by a doctor, um, I find a doctor in quotes, Sebastian um, Keller, who I believe was in Lancaster County, was probably more of a powwow, and um, some members of a family that related to me, the Lau family, made crazy accusations that she participated in a uh, Hecton concert, basically a witch's dance along the road to York, which I can't quite imagine what this would have been, with a fiddle player dressed in red, who's probably the devil. Um, of course, she firmly denied all these things. This is about 100 years before um, the murder of Nelson Raymire. So it's a little belated Halloween sort of thing, but. Um, I'll also get into some of the um, beliefs of Pennsylvania Germans or superstitions, which um, persisted well into the last century, maybe even persist into this century with some people. So um, <coughs> we do not have a meeting in December. In January, it's basically um, come and present something that you have. So if you're on notice, if you, any of you that wish to speak, if you have something interesting you want to talk about briefly, um, please come to our January meeting and you can bring an item, an artifact, or if it's a genealogical story or a historical story, something along those lines. Those meetings have usually proven to be very interesting because we've had a diverse uh, number of, of things presented. Um, then in February, we have Samantha Dorn, and she's going to speak about migrations of the African American families who came to York. Um, voluntary and involuntary. So she's gotten back into um, some of the slavery of her, her families and so forth. And um, they come from various places in the South um, before they came here to York. I'm working on the rest of the program. So the next time I should have a, a more complete um, accounting for you of those, I would uh, have you bear in mind the second Sunday of June, we are scheduled for a Henry James Young Award. That's the award that we give out for excellence in genealogy and local history, named after the late Henry James Young, who was a early librarian here at the, was the Historical Society of York County at that time. Um, if there's anyone you wish to nominate, please do so. We're looking for nominations. And we will be uh, deciding that probably in the new year who the um, recipients of that award will be. Thank you. So today, we're, I think this is his third time that he's come to it, maybe as many years or something along those lines. Um, we have um, Charles Chip Kaufman. Um, Mr. Kaufman is an adjunct faculty member at York College of Pennsylvania, where he teaches languages and language related courses. He's um, taught at several different colleges, and he's a retired, certified U.S. government linguist and author of various articles on languages and linguistics. He's, uh, I would say, very um, knowledgeable in Italian, German, and Russian, as well as other languages, because he's spoken to, to us before about Celtic languages and Native American languages. Um, he does have Pennsylvania German roots, so I suggest at this time to maybe talk about the um, Pennsylvania German dialects that we had in this area. Um, very prevalent at one time, um, now prevalent certainly among the Amish and certain communities like that, not so much among the general population. But I will tell you a short little thing. Henry Young was the person who told me this. This was before the United States got into World War I, probably the late 30s, very early 40s. He did so much research at the Register of Wills office. He was there a lot to do for the family reports that he put together here. 
And it was a lady who I believe her last name was Ziegler, actually, because he was related to her distantly. Um, not maybe a dis direct descendant of this Katarina Ziegler who was accused of witchcraft, but she came to the register and indicated that she was not comfortable conducting the probate in English and could, could the register do it in, in, in Deutsch and the register obliged and the, and the probate was done in Pennsylvania Deutsch. And that was when the eve of World War II. Today, you wouldn't find that, but um, an interesting side. So we, we welcome Charles Kaufman. Today, it's going to be about Pennsylvania German language heritage. And without further ado, if you welcome Chip Kaufman. I think I can hand out more of these uh, agendas. There was a gentleman who came in there. Um, Anybody need a hand Richard asked me to speak three hours today, so I decided to cut it back to two. Uh, no, don't worry, it's not going to be two hours. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Charles K. Kaufman. Uh, I'll, by your college, I've been a professor from the Sprachwissenschaft. And as a kid, I've been in Lancaster Spekarin gewohnt. And Heiß möchte ich ein bisschen schwätze mit Pennsylvania Deutsch. So, viel Spaß. Wir haben es. Wir haben ein Eindruck hier. Das ist gut. Das ist gut. Okay, wir kommen. In den late 1930s there was a young lady named Lillian Geisler, who was from Millersville. She had people around her who spoke Pennsylvania Dutch. And she went off to um, Millersville. Back then it was the normal college, then it became the state teacher's college, I think the year she graduated. And because her father was the chef, when, many women did not go to college in those years. And she was able to go because her father was the chef at the normal school and then the state teacher's college. Lillian went to her first teaching job was at Stormstown One Room Schoolhouse over near Leola. And even though she knew a little bit of Pennsylvania Dutch, she didn't realize how much she was going to learn from the children because she was going to teach the three R's. And she this is not the Stormstown schoolhouse. That's been removed. This is the the one room schoolhouse that was still in operation at Snake Hill, which is about, I'm going to say, a half mile to a mile from the Stormstown schoolhouse location. So she went, she went off to teach this and taught uh, children, Amish children primarily, and she had to learn Pennsylvania Dutch. So as years went on, she met a man from New Holland and married him and had three sons. I'm one of those sons. And so she's the woman who gave me the inspiration to get into so many languages because she would sing opera. She sang, she, she was a school teacher, especially ed in Lancaster City, was president of the Lancaster Education Association. And she, she was just so talented in voice. And I, I mentioned she sang opera. She did, uh, Mount Gretna, probably 20 years she did those, she did summer stock, and they had all these plays about the Amish, and she was considered a regional expert in Amish, in the, in the Amish, uh, the culture, the traditions, uh, the beliefs, and so forth. And so she's the one that gave me the inspiration to get, to get interested in Pennsylvania Dutch. So fast forward, I lived in Germany three different times with my government work, and I came home and she said, come on, we're going out to Annie Glick's house. They're going to have a big, they're going to have a big um, fresser eye out there and we're going to uh, enjoy the afternoon. So I thought, well, this would be fun. I just got back from Germany and I spoke with some of the young guys and they said, oh, Jakey, we're not saying it right. <laughs> yeah, we're saying it all wrong. I said, no, no, don't change the way you speak your language because it's just, it has so much heritage in it. So they were using a lot, that particular family spoke very close to Swiss. And my family came from Switzerland in 1699. 
So that's why this Pennsylvania Dutch topic is so close to my heart. Okay, you have the little sheet that shows what you're, uh, what we're talking about today. Uh, it's all the who, what, where, why, the interrogatives. And I'm going to try to give you an overview of Pennsylvania German slash Dutch. And I'm going to use those interchangeably. And hopefully by the time you leave today, you'll, you'll know why it's called Pennsylvania Dutch and why it's called Pennsylvania German. So, and we're going to talk a little bit briefly about the culture. Uh, it's so rich, we could get into so many different facets of the culture, but it, so I just want to touch on it because there's some nice words that we use. And the future of Pennsylvania Dutch. So I teach language and linguistics at your college. I teach a world languages course from ancient languages to today's languages. There are over 6,000 languages. And it's, is this on? It is on, it's on, okay, good. Uh, so with uh, going into this, what is Pennsylvania Dutch? So I thought perhaps I would give you a little sample of what it sounds like. Aus wenig Jus Deutsch ist unig die Pennsylvania Deutsch, aber a Pennsylvania German oder Pennsylvania Deutsch, Pennsylvania Dutch, in etwa in English. Is a spruch as Schwedzbach, but by the life 300 life in there in Swansko states in the USA and in Ontario, Canada. Smells from the Schwedzer in Heid, Amische and Urmenische und Deutsch a heizen auch Schwedzer to ihre Kinder, aber es hat a ein Latz, Lutrische und Reformierte und Leid von ein bisschen andere Gemeinschaften, wo die Urspruch noch Schwedzkan, die Schwedzhen. So basically what this says is there are three, there are three Pennsylvania Dutch, there are three languages that make up Pennsylvania Dutch, or three languages spoken by the Pennsylvania Germans. One is German, one is Pennsylvania German, which came from a dialect, and I'll show you a map with that, um, that shows where that is, um, and Pennsylvania Dutch, which is the good old Dutchy that you hear around when, they, when the people talk a little Dutchy in the language. So about 300,000 people in more than 20 states and um, from, from Idaho to Maryland to New York to uh, Canada. And the primarily the speakers of Amish, of, of Pennsylvania Dutch are Amish and the Mennonites and uh, the Reformed Lutheran, um, churches and the other communities where the mother's the mother language was spoken to the children. Uh, I'd like to go to market and speak with the uh, with the Amish at market. The children don't they're always embarrassed to speak a little bit. So okay. So the three languages, these are the ones I mentioned. There's standard German, which is still used in the the uh, the church services by the Amish and the and the Mennonites. They will use the standard Bible that came over um, in the 17th century and um, 18th, 18th century, and also the Bible that goes into the 19th century. So they're still using the, the Bible that goes back hundreds of years. The dialects of German, there are several dialects, and, and I'll explain how they came from France, from the Netherlands, from Germany, from Switzerland, and, and some very minor parts of Austria. The Dutchified English is basically a Creolized language, which is a mix, mix of languages. Everyone here thinks of Creole and they think the Cajuns and so forth, but the word Creole is a mix of languages that uh, came from pidgin languages. And then it became an actual full-blown language over a thousand words and, and, uh, and so forth. Okay. But there are many spelling variations. So if you see something, you'll say, well, that, that's not what Kaufman had. When I went to, to the genealogical meeting, that he spelled it differently. It's, it is, they, they, there are so many different forms of spelling in Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, and I'm going to show you uh, more examples of that. So where did it originate? The uh, Heimatsländer, the homeland, came mainly, you had a little bit of the Netherlands because. Menno Simon, the, the founder of the, the Mennonites uh, belief, uh, he, he actually had gone up into the Netherlands. He spoke Frisian. Frisian is about as close to English 
as a language can get. Friesian and, and parts of Dutch are very close. Real Dutch, the Nederlands Dutch the, uh, of, of the Netherlands. Uh, little parts of area of these Luxembourg, Germany, Switzerland, France, and right in here, the Alsace, the eastern part of France is, is also a point of origin for the Pennsylvania Germans. So here's Germany, large country, and I have lived in right in here, I live right in there, and I live down in this area. So this, is, this gives you an idea of the dialectal region. When people from this area come to York County and Lancaster County, they're struck by the, how close the languages are to, to their language. The, the Pennsylvania Dutch is, is close to um, their dialect, and they're able to communicate pretty freely. So this is a larger map right in here, the Rhineland or Latinate area. And this is the dominant area for Pennsylvania German coming to New York and Lancaster and uh, all around Berks County, Philadelphia, and so forth. <clears throat> so the original homeland, just some perspective, Germany did not exist as a unified country until 1871. So it was a lot of blue, a patchwork of, of these little regions, duchies, and so forth. The word Germania came from Tacitus, the historian, the Roman historian, in 98 Common Era AD. And he called Germania, he called the region Germania because the tribes referred to themselves as Germania, that, that particular area. Um, the word Dutch came from Low German in the 9th and 12th centuries AD Common Era. Uh, so the word Dutch gets mixed up with Deutsch. I'm, I'm going to get into the etymology of the word. So the original Germans in Pennsylvania came from the Rhineland, in Germany, Switzerland, Austria, Netherlands, Belgium, Alsace, and other areas. Collectively, hundreds of years ago, they were called Dutch, collectively. <clears throat> Our archaic meaning, Deutsch, is considered groups for German and Dutch. So they, prior to the Thirty Years War, Germany and the Netherlands were part of the Holy Roman Empire. And, and that's important because they didn't exist as a national entity. They, they were referred to as, as the Dutch. <clears throat> so the etymology of the words, I, I have to put this in on the linguist. So the German, the German words come from Theodor, which is Proto-Germanic, which means tribe, Teuta. We, you've heard of Teutonic, so Teutonic. The common Germanic people. Each huge Theodish Yuga. This is the Gothic. So you have Old Dutch, Old High German, Old English. So they all have some form of Deutsch Dutch. So you can see where the confusion comes in. Later, the two distinct words that were used on the continent of Europe were Dies for the Dutch and Deutsch for German. Today, the Dutch are called Nederlander and the and the Germans are called Deutsch. Deutsch, Deutsch. Okay, so why Pennsylvania? Why did they come to Pennsylvania? There were people, my family in Switzerland was persecuted because they, they didn't want to ally with the Holy Roman Empire, uh, with the Church of Rome, Catholicism. So the roots of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Dutch come from the Anabaptist movement in Europe during the Reformation, so the early 1500s. Martin Luther translated the Bible, uh, the, he translated the Old Testament in the 1520s, and he translated the New Testament in the early 1530s. <laughs> and he translated it into German, because the Germans were tired of putting money in the collection plate for, them, for the leaders of the Holy Roman Empire. So basically, it totally changed the Germanic language because German spread because of another thing, the Gutenberg Press. The Gutenberg Press was developed shortly before the translation of the Bible. And then the, the Bible was, trans, was printed in 100,000 copies. And Martin Luther made the language the language of the people. 
one that they could understand, not flowery language. There are so many different versions of the Bible. So, okay. Uh, the Anabaptists are people who believe that they take their baptismal rites after they become adults, where they can know the difference between, between right and wrong. Um, they were called heretics, put to death by Catholics and some Protestants. So they fled to the hills. My ancestor, Isaac Kaufman, the original Kaufman to come from Switzerland to Lancaster County, bought land from William Penn, and he hid in the hills. Um, <clears throat> so the two Anabaptists of, of note, the origins of the Mennonite Neonic, we had Menno Simons, 1496 to 1561. So in the 1500s, he was um, a speaker of freezing, I mentioned. He rejected the Catholic Church. And in 1544, the term Mennonite was used to refer to the Dutch Anabaptists. They were followers of Menno Simons. I'm going to talk more about the Mennonites. Like Jacob Amman was 1644 to 1730. And the word Amish comes from Amman, from this individual. The followers of Amman, of Amman split from the Mennonites because of the practice of migraine, migraine which is the social rejection. <clears throat> German speakers were attracted to Pennsylvania by a number of factors, but, but the main factor was vast farmlands that looked just like the Rhineland Palatinate. When the Germans come over here, they say, oh, I feel so much at home. When my father came over to Germany, where I was living, he said, I feel really at home here. My father was a farm boy from New Holland, and he even could understand words that the people were saying. My father didn't realize how much Pennsylvania Dutch he spoke. Um, and I didn't realize how much I did until I went away to college, and all the kids from Long Island said, Kaufman, you talk funny. <laughs> so the founder of William Penn invited settlers. Isaac Kaufman was our first. And my wife and I named our son Isaac after Isaac Altman, and we shortened it to Zach. They were fleeing persecution, uh, but they had a common religious conviction as Penn, William Penn, who was a Quaker, uh, very anti war and, and helping one another. So by the 1700s, there was this strong attraction for religious freedom and open farmland in Pennsylvania. By the end of the 18th century, Pennsylvania's population of German was 33%. Now, I like to throw out, there's, uh, in the Ali talk that I gave on this subject, it was much different than this one today. Uh, well, there, there's some commonality. The, there was a myth that our forefathers debated whether to use German as the language of the United, of the colonies. When, when we formed, but that was only, they only discussed it as a means. Yeah. I, I came from the government the defense and we used language for, um, to be cryptic. And they, want, they felt that maybe the English couldn't understand German. So maybe we should conduct our military operations entirely in German during, uh, during the revolution. So that's just a sideline. So some of the milestones in German immigration, and keep in mind, Pennsylvania Dutch evolved. All languages evolved. That English is evolving. I see so many changes in English, sometimes from one year to the next. The, the first Germans to come to this country were in Jamestown. There were a few. 1683, there were 13 German Mennonite families that came to Southeast Pennsylvania. And this is where the town of Deutschestetten was set up. Deutschestetten is, is Germantown near Philadelphia. And they actually started to, produ uh, to produce a German newspaper. Zeitung is a newspaper. In the 1700s, more and more religious Freedom seekers came to this country, the Swiss Mennonites, the Dunkers, the Schenkfelders, the Moravians, and they all had uh, the, the belief that they wanted to reform from the Catholic, Catholic Church and some of the strictness of the Protestant Church. 1732, first German newspaper, 
1790, 33% of the population of Pennsylvania was German. And in the 1880s, now these were, these Germans before this, so 100 years before, started to speak their own dialects and mix with English and so forth. And this particular period, these Germans were sort of frowned upon by the people who existed before that period. I said, that's just a very quick summary of the, of the, uh, of the history. So where is Pennsylvania Dutch spoken? Well, in Budo Lake is the um, and other areas. This is the, that beautiful farmland in Lancaster County. So also you have all these counties and they're also out in Idaho and uh, Indiana is, is a state where there's a, quite a few uh, Amish communities. And I understand down in the Eastern shore of Maryland, there are Amish communities as well, using Pennsylvania Dutch. The Deitschewei, the Deitschewei is the German speaking area. This, this is predominantly, here we have Lancaster County, York County, Berks County, and uh, Lehigh, Northampton, York. York County at one point had a very strong Pennsylvania Dutch presence. My college professor from Franklin Marshall, uh, Dr. J. William Fry, one of the most colorful people I've ever met. Um, and, no, he is the most colorful person I've ever met. Does anybody know Dr. Fry? He was from East Prospect, and he grew up speaking two native languages, English and Pennsylvania Dutch. <laughs> so how many speakers? If you were following when I spoke in the beginning, um, estimated at 300,000. Now, part of the problem is with the census, where people say, what is your native language? And people say, well, my native language is Dutch, but they meant German. And some people would say, well, German, but I, I speak Dutch. So the numbers are a little bit frahoodled, as they say, <laughs> in the language. So the issue, the other thing that we have going on with this number is we have sectarians and non-sectarians. So those who are believers, the Amish, the Mennonites, and so forth, the reform, and the non-sectarian are, are good old Pennsylvania Dutchmen up in Botox County and some of these other places, Kutz, Kutztown and so forth, where you have people who speak the language. They grew up speaking it and they didn't have any association with, say, the Amish or the Mennonites. <clears throat> so what is Pennsylvania Dutch? Uh, I mentioned Dr. Fry. Character and absolutely, I had him for Russian at, uh, at Franklin Marshall College, and uh, he played in the Lancaster Symphony Orchestra, like Richard uh, in New York, and he played several instruments. But he was totally gifted with languages. At, at F and M, he taught probably a dozen to fifteen different languages, including African languages. But he grew up with Pennsylvania Dutch as a language and English. Lived over in uh, East Prospect, and uh, he has written several books. He's the original authority on Pennsylvania German, and he's the one that says there really are three languages that are going on here in Pennsylvania German. Don Yoder, I couldn't go without mentioning Don Yoder. He was a professor at University of Pennsylvania, but he's considered um, the Professor Emeritus with American uh, folk life for the Amish, uh, Pennsylvania Dutch. And these two were absolute pillars of documenting the language and the culture. That's not found in your picture. Yeah. That's subtle crazy. That's crazy. Oh, gosh. My, oh, that's hard. I'm so sorry. Uh, I, I was fooling around with pictures, and that's not critical. My apologies. I would correct that. <laughs> All right, Pennsylvania Dutch languages. Uh, Dr. Fry mentioned these three standard German dialects and the Dutch Bible. So, what's a dialect? A dialect is an offshoot of a standard language. The word dialect came from Greek dialectus, and it refers to conversation and Dialects usually have mutual intelligibility with the standard language or the spoken uh, language. So the dialects of German that make up Pennsylvania Dutch came from the Rhineland Palatinate 
uh, Hirschenberg and from Swiss German. And, and Swiss German is very different. Standard German, primarily, I, me I mentioned written, uh, spoken, and used in the, uh, the readings in the church, in the, uh, the gatherings at the meeting houses and so forth. The Amish meet in homes, in their specific homes. The, the, um, the Mennonites have meeting houses. So when you, yes. I do have a question about high German. So is it mostly the German from Martin Luther's translation of the Bible? Evolved from that, yes. So is that actually a Saxon or a, some sort of dialect from that part? That's where Luther was from. Yes. Okay. Yes. And and the thing with all languages, including German, they have um, the the, um, the the language changes and they reform it. There have been as recent as the 1960s, there have been reforms on the German language. Um, so all languages will go through some, some form of um, updating. Scriptural passages quoted in High German uh, reflects the German as it was spoken in the U.S. in the 19th century. That's where we are now, the Heimlich. So the Amish and the Mennonites use the standard German in their sense. So the dialect, the Pennsylvania Deutsch, the Mutterspruch, which is the mother mother tongue, the dialects uh, came, as I mentioned, in Rhineland and Palatinate. That's one of the big areas. Baden-Württemberg, the Schwäbisch language is, is quite unusual and, and in some cases unrecognizable. The pronunciation differences are, appear in Pennsylvania German across across all the states. So I mentioned when I spoke with the, the Amish boys, the the Swiss the Swiss German that they used was quite different uh, than, the, than the German of other Pennsylvania Dutch. So you have pronunciation differences, you have simplification of grammar, the state spelling. So going back, here's the area. So this is all Germany, Rhineland, Latinate, France, and so forth. So just comparing Pennsylvania Dutch with um, German. So Guten Tag, hello, Guten Tag, they say Guten Tag, Guten Tag. What is your name? Wie ist dein Name? Was ist dein Name? How are you today? Wie geht es dir heute? Wie bist du heute? And thank you is danke, and they say danke, or they'll say danke, or danke, or danke. So there's all forms of danke, and you can say, did you say danke this day? See you later, bis später, sehen dich später, see you later. Auf Wiedersehen, they just say mach's gut, make it well, mach's gut. So I'd like to read the, the Lord's Prayer in in uh, German, so you can hear the differences between Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Dutch, and, and German. Vater unser in Himmel geheiligt werde dein Name, that's German, then unser Vater in Himmel, Himmel dein Name los heilig sein, dein Reich komme, dein Reich los komme, dein Wille geschehe, wie im Himmel so auf Erde, die Wille los für du sei, wo es wie im Himmel. Unser tägliches Wort gibt uns heute und vergib uns unsere, unsere Schuld, wie auch wir vergeben unsere Schuldigen. Unser tägliches Brot gibt uns heiß und vergab unsere Schulden, wie mehr der Begeber vor uns schuldig sind. Und führe uns nicht in Versuchung, sondern erlöst uns von den Bösen. Und führe uns nicht, und führe uns nicht in die Versuchung, aber halt uns für ein Begeber. Und sieh auch der Brot, der ist. In dein ist das Reich und die Kraft und die Herrlichkeit in Ewigkeit. Amen. Von da ist es Reich, die Kraft und die Herrlichkeit in Ewigkeit. Amen. You can see here the differences, but you can still kind of understand it. Uh, even if you don't know German, you can hear the similarities in, in the uh, spoken. I mentioned that I would show something that shows the, the differences in spelling. Take a look at this from 1934. Maple View Park and Range VA. Pencil Fonish. They don't even have two ends in, in there. Um, but it doesn't matter because the thing that was important is understanding. So people could understand each other. Deutsche, cool, your Deutsche life. I'm all German people. So the third German is the Dutchified English. And I mentioned it's considered a creolized language as well. 
a mix of two or more languages, primarily English. There's usually a superstratum language that exists that is the foundation. And it's like the Creole in Louisiana, French is the superstratum. So English is the superstratum with all kinds of smatterings of, of Deutsch in there. So you have English words pronounced with a German accent. I can tell somebody, if I'm at the Chicago O'Hare Airport and I hear somebody say, I'm 20 years old, I know they're from, they're from Lancaster or York or Berks County. Uh, because everyone says years old, where the rest of the country says years old. I'm 20 years old, as opposed to I'm 20 years old. Because they say, auf Deutsch, ich, ich, habe, ich, bin, ich habe 20. It's 20 Jahre alt. Jahre alt, they say. Borrowed words in German with a slight modification. Rutsch, quit your rutschen. Rutsch means to slide in German. Um, and spritz means to spray something, but Schmitzen also has that connotation. German sentence structure. They, have, they put lots of words. Mark Twain joked about the German language, how German was, was so messed up where, where you don't know what's, what's actually happening. You start the sentence in the beginning of the United States, you cross the Atlantic Ocean, and then they put the, they put the verbs in the mouth of the people that are swimming up from the Atlantic Ocean where you finally find out what's happening in the sentence. Mark Twain is beautiful in the language. So Dutchified English, I love the good old Dutchie. Just follow the crooked road by the quick tail of the fence piece. My mother was prolific in, in Dutchified English. Out in the lights months, I grew up with this. Rent, rent the bed, rent, rent up your room, Johnny. Make the lights out. Because in German, they say, Mach die Licht aus. Mach die the better now. What, what gives the weather now? Throw Papa down the stairs his slippers, throw the cow over the fence and hang on. You've all heard, how many of you have heard these kinds of expressions? They're good, aren't they? Yeah, but that's a fighting is fun. Yet and still, my mother used to always use expressions with yet. In German, it's noch. So yet, in German, noch means yet and it means still. So in English, they say, are you still speaking, are you still learning German? You would use no in German still, but have you been there yet? They still they would say no. We have two words for it, so they confuse that. You living at home yet? Uh, where they mean still double conditionals. I didn't know that I was using double conditionals until I went off to college, and I realized that that's Pennsylvania German for us. If I would have been you, I would have bought those cows instead of if I were you. I would have bought those cows. Uh, Germanic syntax, I mentioned that just once now. Bread, me all over, mit apple a piece of bread. So spread some apple butter all over for me, and, but you don't find out what's happening till the end. <laughs> by, house by you, come by us. Um, I wonder if, my father used to always say this, me. I wonder if, uh, that's how they would say it in German, literally. I mind of that. My father said that all the time. Uh, I mind of that. Some more Dutchified English. Nixie looks is a devilish, mischievous person. A sh a schmutz. A schmutz is used quite a bit. It means dirt, uh, dirt or mud. In German, schmutz to bunk up, grease up, uh, dirty. They'll also sometimes cross schmutz and schmusen. Schmusen to kiss. They have boos, get a bit of boos. Rutsch mentioned, put your rutschen, squirming. Strubli, ah, your hairs are so strubli, your hairs are so messed up. Spritz, he spritz us with the hose. Verhudelt, verhudelt is confused. Ah, the humans are so verhudelt. Finally, I have an example here. You dirty rutsch now, schmutli, so you will give cuts. So cutsen <laughs> means to throw up. Don't don't swill like a pig. Don't throw up. Okay, so what is the culture? This is just a little snapshot of culture. They have culture that goes back to the old world traditions that are still there, and it's one of the things I like about going back to Lancaster now. We have a little bit of it in York County, but not as much as Lancaster and, and Berks County. I mentioned the, the meeting places. So you have the meeting places, the old order Mennonites. They have meeting house 
So when you drive along Route 23 or some of those places, 322, you'll see the, the old meeting houses with the horses and the, and the carriages. They're the followers of Menno Simon. They don't believe, though they believe in using technology where the Anabaptists predominantly reject modern technology. Although I've heard two weeks ago that the Amish have agreed to allow children to have scooters that have been powered by solar or solar batteries. That's that I just heard that two weeks ago. So that's pretty amazing. I, mean, I was amazed when I saw children on rollerblades. Uh, okay, so the Amish, instead of meeting, a lot of people think they're Amish. Those are old order Mennonites, and they dress with all black and so forth. And the whereas the the Amish meet in someone's home, they'll they'll move from home to home. All right, so I put this in. I realize I said 21st century, but the the main piece of literature, which is part of culture, comes from Henry Harbaugh, which is Harbaugh's Harfair. And it's, it's basically poems that are in Pennsylvania Dutch. Music, uh, church hymns. I mentioned my mother was a good singer, and she was she performed at the uh, the old country church at the Kutztown Folk Festival for about thirty five years, and uh, she was on the cover of the Kutztown Folk Festival magazine and so forth because everybody knew her as the the lady that sang all the old church hymns that were some in German, some were in English. <clears throat> Fraktur. A lot of people associate Fraktur with, with the Pennsylvania Dutch. Fraktur means broken script, and it's the Amish. <clears throat> the Amish and Mennonites, for the most part, don't use it. Uh, you might see something in in a home, but the uh, it's it's used to just fancy form of art highlight whether it's a birth certificate. My wife and I were married in Lancaster and we had back then the Lancaster City Courthouse had afforded people the opportunity to have their marriage certificate in German and, and have it done in the Frock Tour scripts. So it was written and it was beautiful. I think they've stopped that. That was 1992. So you have four scripts in the courts in South China, birth and back baptismal certificates. When you go into someone's home, they will have it. And these are predominantly the non-sectarian. Okay, food. Trust me on this one. Uh, pot boy is pot pie, filling. That is how they would say it. Food. Zymaga, hog mall. I can't get past that one. That's such that's, that's good as a pig stomach. Melasses freedom kuche and shoe fly pie. Basically, molasses, molasses pie. Gift with a schnitz of your molasses freedom kuche. A schnitz und nep. Has anyone ever had schnitz und nep? Yes. <laughs> um, chow chow is pickled vegetables came from the Alsace where they, they eat a lot of charcut, which is, which is sauerkraut and sour um, fermented things, vegetables. Lemon and bologna. <laughs> Lemon and bologna, lap butter, it's apple butter. Schmierkäse is the cottage cheese. And if you've ever had Lapwark or Schmierkäse, they also say Schmierkäse. Um, that apple butter with cottage cheese is going. Fastnacht. Fastnacht is the eve of fasting. So this is right before Lent when everybody goes out, goes to the giant or Safeway. I have to. Be. Okay, and where you'll see the Foss Knox available. My mother always brought them home. And I had no idea what a Foss Knox was until I lived in Germany and Austria. Uh, Room spray, I, I put this in just to mention that um, the because they're Anabaptists, they, they don't go through the baptismal acceptance of the church until they're adults, typically around 21. So this comes from German, have a Rumspringen. Uh, to jump around and, and it conjures up just being kind of flighty. And this is the period where young people are allowed to go and see if they want to enjoy it, to join the English way of life, which is how they refer to the non, uh, non German way of life, go to the English way of life or if they want to remain in the church. There's a little tradition. That my mother taught me that the the Amish 
love to go, and I don't know if they still do it, but she said when she was teaching, they would do it. If you cross a bridge and you're with somebody and you give them a kiss for good luck. So growing up in high, in high school, I went to Lancaster McCaskey High School. And uh, if I liked a girl, I, we'd go out on a date. And if I liked her, I would find the covered bridge. <laughs> and back then, there were about 25 of them. And I would find one. And if, sometimes it was a little more than good luck. So I had a lot of good luck. <laughs> what is the future of Pennsylvania Dutch? The young lady here um, on skate on the rollerblades. Is it a threatened language? Is it morbid? Uh, it could be argued that it's that it's threatened. It's not necessarily dying. Some would argue that it's dying, but um, children are still learning it. And many people after Rumspringa or Rumspringa come back to the church. So the language continues, as I mentioned, the young people at market or if I stop at a roadside stand for root beer or blueberries or corn, and I speak to the children, they are very reluctant to, to speak with me. So, but I do know that they're learning, they can understand the German because they speak it with their, with their parents. The legacy of Pennsylvania Dutch will happen in places. Good old Pittsburgh County, Yodic County, Yodic County is York County, Lennon County, Lennon County, Products County, with Berks County, and there are others. You've got Lehigh and Northampton. So you have place names. It's kind of like, like American Indian place names that we have here in along the Susquehanna. Place names are what survive. You go to Hawaii, place names, street names, many of the names are of the indigenous language, even though the language, the spoken language might be diminished. So this is where the legacy will carry on. Willkommen zu Kutzestädel. Kutzestädel is, is Kutztown. And a Kutze is a wagon. So it used to be called Wagon Town. Kutztown was Wagon Town. Um, cats back, cats of Uppelbeck. So they actually translated that into English, but put the German underneath it. And Schoenack, has anyone ever been to Schoenack? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Schoenack uh, means a beautiful, beautiful quarter. Beautiful corner of the world. In the shoe house on the click, and one, and you understand what that means? Schoolhouse by the creek. Cool schoolhouse on the creek. Children in, in these one room schoolhouses are still, and they're renovating these schoolhouses. The children are still using Pennsylvania Dutch. So, what's being done? There, there are these round hall lodges, the Blue Side Lodge and the Sound. Uh, there's a, a journal called Hüve wie Grüne which is published by the Pennsylvania Cultural Heritage Center over at Kutztown. It means here, like over there. We speak the language here, like they speak the language over there. And there are Germans who, who have the dialect, the Palatinate dialect, who help out with writing articles because they're very similar to the Pennsylvania Dutch. <clears throat> Online sources, this, this gentleman, Professor Douglas Maybeford, is a genius in promoting the Pennsylvania Dutch language. He has all kinds of YouTube. I have his name on here. My wife said, why don't you put one of those little things that you, that you put your phone up to in a, in a little code? And I said, too complicated. I'm just gonna put YouTube, Douglas maybe for your Pennsylvania Dutch minute. He teaches you all kinds of words and expressions. He plays instruments. If you wanna get into Pennsylvania Dutch lore, he's very good. This guy's a, like a one-man band. He is really pushing Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, there's another gentleman, uh, Frank Kessler, who is actually German, and he lives in Belgium with his business. And I've spoken with, with him, and um, Douglas Maidenford and I have been in contact uh, a little bit. Both of these individuals are keeping it alive. They're keeping the dialect alive. And the... the Logo for the German Pennsylvania Association of America. We still speak the, the mother language. So, if you would be good, I've been subscribing to that for probably 10 years and I uh, highly recommend these. So, I'll come all uh, So, where can you hear Pennsylvania Dutch? Go to the markets, go out, drive out routes uh, 340 and 23 and so forth over in Lancaster County. 
You don't hear much in your county other than some of the vendors at Eastern Market. Some final thoughts. Pennsylvania German has a rich tradition, and it, the language is as old as the United States, which is amazing. There are, there's German, there's the dialect, and there's Dutchified English. The language is still spoken by many, over 300,000. There are some countries, uh, there are some languages that, uh, that are, they have a quarter of a million, but they're still thriving. The language is being promoted using technology. So like with American Indian languages, which is one of my interests, it's really, it's being promoted through technology. Children are learning Lakota language, Navajo, Cheyenne, um, Cherokee languages because of technology. So the efforts to continue are enabling the growth of the dialect and uh, the language will remain a sense of identity for many right here. And here we are on a Sunday afternoon, you could be at the pool or you could be out enjoying the sunshine and we have a nice, a nice group here. So, danke. And here are many sources, and I apologize for the mix up on the Crayville. Um, he was late. He was late to tell him that. He was late to tell him that. Don Yoder's, Don Yoder's picture was, uh, it said Don Yoder. So, and I, I, I attributed that down here. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. I just wanted to mention you're probably familiar with our own Pennsylvania Dutch poet, um, Henry Lee Fisher, yes. who is in Sherman, New York. And he's also written to Henry Carball. They're both descended from uh, Yip Carball, the original immigrant in hell uh, in the 1740s, as is Rick Lavon. Wow. So they were all like cousins. Thank you. But, Thank you uh, for sharing that. And Henry Lee Fisher wrote three of my favorite poems. Wow. And what are they? Uh, they translate to. Uh, uh, the old market house in the middle of the city, uh, open Good. times and pleasures and past time. And we Excellent. have them all here. Excellent. Yeah. That's great. Anyone else want to share something or ask a question? The gentleman who did the um, the marriage um, certificates was Professor Robert Hostetter from Millersville. He was the one that did that. It, at the courthouse? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, there was... There was a <clears throat> there was a woman who was handling it, and I, apparently he did do it, but I don't think they do it anymore. And and, um, and and there was a woman who was handling it, and I still think she was Mennonite, and she was very upset that my wife was keeping her name because her her family name for genealogy experts her family name and ended with her. Her sister, one of her sisters, died. She had a sister that. That um, married her family. The last her last name was going to end with her. And I said when we got married, why don't you just keep your name? Everybody knows you by that. And um, the woman that handled the birth certificate, she just could not understand that. She thought that was the and and little. We should have gone back ten years later to tell her we have children and we gave them my wife's last name, but they have my middle name as my my last name is their middle name. Yeah. Yes, sir. In my family, my two great grandparents were from Bavaria. And I believe they spoke German. Yes. Over in Columbia area. Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, right yeah. over here. And uh, I lived in Columbia, Maryland. And my great grandfather moved here, and I believe he spoke, spoke a lot of German. Yes. But I never knew either of them. Now, if you get down to my grandparents, and they never spoke German with me, but then my with my parents, they, when they wanted to hide from from their level, the siblings, uh, what they were talking about, they would speak German. And I don't know. I think that was standard German, but I don't know if it, if it had Pennsylvania Dutch. I know. I don't know any of the words right now. I should have brought them. I wrote them down because my cousin. Wrote it down from her mother. Um, uh, you don't remember it. Uh, but it, there were, <coughs> and they were mad the kids. They would say something in German. Yeah. Uh, 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 and 
and and or if they were hiding something from the kids, they would say something in German. That's my grandparents. Yes. But they never spoke German any other time. Yes. So is that typical? And do you think maybe many of them spoke a Pennsylvania judge? Dutch by the time they got to say the great my grand. Well, it's absolutely typical. Families always use different language to, to hide from the children. But the but I can say that the Bavarian German is quite different than the, the German that is Pennsylvania Dutch, the dialect of the Rhineland Latinate. But there are a lot of similarities. Like I use the expression make the Make uh, the I'd like to speak uh, would be uh, mogi, mogi, mogi in Irish in the Bavarian dialect. So it can be different, uh, but so there are some similarities. More of a standard yeah. dialect in Bavaria. But but many people in Bavaria, uh, unless they're highly highly educated, they don't speak a whole lot of. Uh, now I, I've got to be careful with this because I I could just hear the the complaints. <laughs> I lived in Bavaria for almost 10 years and they, I'm going back to Bavaria in, in four weeks for a wedding and they really love to go right into the dialect. Now, when they go to Munich or they go into schools and things, they use the high German, the Hochdeutsch. Yeah, I don't want to make it sound like Bavarians are, out, are, are, are uneducated people. They're not, they just love to use their language because it feels like an old pair of jeans that you put on. Well, they, they are very, uh, by their very nature, they're, they're even separate of Germany. Uh, they retain their, their uh, old uh, pre-1871. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot there. I mean, your, your point is well taken. Just yes. the story to share, elaborate what you're saying. My paternal grandparents were from Bavaria, and they came here in World War One, And my father married, an Italian Irish woman. So my mother wanted to impress her German in law, so she took some classes in German. So she was so excited to go over there and start speaking to them in German. And my grandmother said, Oh, we don't speak that high German. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of people, a lot of people don't. Yeah, you're right. That's good. Yes. Does the word our word uh fracture or fracture is that related to prop tour? Yes, I would kind of see it was. Yeah, I mean it, trying trying to keep this less than an hour and, and there's just so much there's just so much uh, that with all the culture and the, the history and the poetry and question yes yiddish how close is that to like the rhineland dialect i'm gonna say it's pretty close uh, I, i'm doing a talk at ollie on yiddish in, a, in october I, I, I specialized in Slavic languages at University of Pennsylvania in grad, when I was in grad school. So all the Slavic languages, Polish, Ukrainian, and Russian. But I really, really, my hobby is the Germanic languages because I've had Dutch. I can, I can speak some Dutch. Uh, real, I mean, like Dutch from the Netherlands. And the, um, but the, uh, bye -bye. the Yiddish language is the most colorful language in my repertoire, it's it's to me the most colorful language in the world. Yiddish, the the, the humor is just tremendous, um, and how they if that's total. You have Lithuanian words, you have Polish words, you have even some Italian like Pagliacci in with the, the, the opera. They they use that. They use the word Pagliacci for a, a clown. Um, the Yiddish uses so many expressive words that conjure up. Something that you can't translate in one word. Just translate. Was there a question over here? Anyone else? Any comments? Did you learn anything today? Yes. Or was there, always. Are you all for Google? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. I have never.